pleasure to be on stage, let's say, with Fabio, which is uh, more than a friend and uh, a mentor for me and us in the company. But I'll leave, I'll leave him telling you what he represents as a human. What should I say? You were here yesterday. Yeah. Okay, so. You want me to talk about the concert on the so what, what, what so, should we yeah, talk about? I think t today... The, the um, yes, so, such a beauty. You, know, you can ask any personal question, you know, like... Tell us you your want. story. Huh? Tell us your story. Which kind of story? How did you start with design? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so there are two categories of children, right? The ones that know or imagine what they will do in the future, you know, like, I'm gonna be an astronaut. I belong to the other category, the one that don't know what to do. In fact, my daughters, for example, they really don't know what to do, and I'm not forcing them to take a decision, because it doesn't make sense. And, and so, you know, until I, I turned uh, 18, I really wasn't sure what to do. You know, in Italy, actually, even high school, you're like liceo, it's called liceo, and they're very mm, general. You know, you study any kind of subject. So that when I was actually 17, not even 18, I decided to study architecture, because it was really in the middle of the scientific disciplines and the humanistic disciplines. So it was kind of a balance, you know? Actually, it was a way of not deciding yet. And uh, actually, there was also an handicap, because I'm very bad at sketching, at drawing. I really cannot draw. I mean, I don't know if it's my. I mean, probably now it became kind of a it's not thing to do, you know, because you don't need to draw nowadays. It's enough to use any kind of computer program. But you have to imagine, go back to '84 when I started studying architecture. Computers were not there, so that really either you could sketch or you were stupid, kind of stupid. So it was like, you know, I started with this big end. But I always had a lot of imagination. Like, you know, I come from the suburbs. I come from a, a little town of 100,000 uh, people, in inhabitants. And uh, like all children from little towns, you have a lot of imaginations because you miss a lot of things. <laughs> you know, I really, I can see my daughter. I mean, the, why I say that? Because I compare my daughters. They live in Milan, they were born in Milano. Big city is full of things. But for a child, you kind of suffer that. It's, it's a big pressure. And anyway, so I went from the little town to Milano, and Milano was like an explosion to me. I was like moving to another planet. I was saying, oh my God, here you can do anything. That was amazing. So I lived the years of, uh, of university, like the discoverer of the world for me, really. Seriously, I mean, it's very, it's very strong. I think it was the same with, the, with PJ, really coming from a small city, going to a big city, <coughs> like the world reveals and um, and you have that kind of hunger that all the kids from the suburbs and I had a lot of hunger hunger means that you're angry right yeah uh, a lot of hunger. I was going to everything to all conferences to all movies I mean I was like feeding myself with any kind of cultural food and I was participating to the life of the university so actively. I became the representative of students. I was doing everything, really. I mean, that's something I always suggest to, to the students, you know, to the young students. I mean, if you take a decision, just throw yourself into it. You know, don't, don't deny yourself. I mean, don't, don't step back, not even one little moment. And actually, I can tell you what my turning point was. I was studying like everyone, I mean, good votations, but that's not the point. I was um, attending a very interesting uh, course from, uh, from a professor that was a very wild, crazy professor, but really interesting. And he was inviting any kind of people to give speeches in his course. One day came this American, uh, Israeli-American artist to give a speech in English. Actually, I was one of the few kids in Italy that learned English in high school, because nobody is able to learn English in high school. The level of English is very low in Italy. But anyway, 
Uh, so I could get the, the license, that's why I'm, I'm underlining. Uh, and this American artist, in the end of the lesson, said, who wants to come to Venice with me to be my assistant, because I'm going to install my work for the Venice Pieta. So, you have to think, try to collocate yourself at the time. All, the, all students were uh, very close to the exam session, so that, you know, you had a lot of things to do. So nobody was raising hands. I, I immediately said, I will come, I will come. I mean, none was raising their hands. It means that they knew their duty was to pass exams. They knew that the exams were, you know, a, a week later. So nobody was, you know, thinking about transgressing this kind of rule. I was. So I, I said, I will come, I will come, I will, I will do anything. And it was my first time to the Venice Biennale. It was. 1990, okay, 1990. The year I was born. The year I was born. Okay, I discovered that this was one of the best American uh, artists of, at the time. And he was competing with another American artist named Jeff Koontz. That was in the, in the young artist part of the Biennale. So they were both in the, in the section Aperto, which is the, really the, the young artist section. And uh, so imagine, we were installing here, Jeff Kutz was installing there. I don't know if you remember the work with Cicciolina. You remember that he married the porn stars? Yes. You know, and it was exactly that, that work. That was, it was amazing. And in the house where we were staying, uh, first of all, it belonged to the most important fashion designer of that time. His name was Romeo Gigi. I didn't know of that, of course. And with us, given that the house was very big in Venice, there was Ettore Sozzas, which was my hero in the design world. So that you see, all of a sudden, you say, what the fuck, what's going on? <laughs> you know, dreams come true, I mean, what, what's going on? And, and I was there, you know? And, uh, and these are really the turning points, because then with this guy, I became very good friends all the time. I was coming to Italy, I was driving him, him around. You know, when kids nowadays say, I don't want to be your slave, but we have been everybody's slave before. <laughs> so it's the, it's the wheel of life in some way. So it's something you have to accept, right? But just because you need to grow, you need to learn. And anyway, uh, when I took the degree two years later in 1992, my professor, one of my professors, offered me to, um, to become a teacher at the university because he said, you know, Fabio, you're very good in communicating. I think you could be a very good professor. And said, you know what? I'm going to New York. And because and, um, I was invited by these American artists that we became very good friends, you know, to go freely in his house, you know, not paying because, you know, money was, <laughs> was a big problem at the time. And, uh, but I could work in, uh, in the gallery of his gallery of uh, his galleries. Her name was Olly Solomon. I don't know who of you knows about the artwork. Olly Solomon Gallery at that time was very big. Uh, so I was working as an assistant there and I started studying uh, movie direction at the New York University. You know, because really the fact that I couldn't draw was balanced by the fact that I was very good at making stories. And I was very good at writing. So the writing a script for me was very easy. So I also thought, really, the evolution, also because I love cinema, I mean, I, I love movies. I thought really the evolution could be that job. And you know, usually you are judged by the friends you come out with, right? And I was going out with amazing people. Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee, in a lot of artists. I mean, really, they were the, the kids of my surrounding. They were living in the same area in New York. I mean, think about, it was 1993, you know? I mean, all these people were young, were full of energy. We were going to Jackie 60, which was the, the, the cool disco at the time. I mean, it was really cool, the situation. So, I bumped into this Italian fashion designer. Her name was Anna Molinari. She looked at me. I mean, I was kind of cool among these very good people. And she said, Fabio, you are an architect. You must do my shop. And she was opening a new fashion shop in uh, Hong Kong. And they said, but you know that they have no experience. She said, yeah, but I know you can do it. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have, of course, you have to have this turning point. You know, it's, it's about luck. It's about uh, ca uh, casual, I mean, whatever. Not casual. What is it? Casual. Fate. Fate. No. Fate. 
No, fa, 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 whatever. Uh, so I give only one condition to her. The condition is, please let me go there because I have to be in control of the building site. Of course, it was tricky because I, I couldn't draw. So I used to be there now that to say, do this, do this, this lower, this, you know, a little more curvy, whatever. Anyway, I could manage to work with these Chinese workers speaking the most, the universal spoken language in the world, which is dirty English. It's not English. I mean, you don't speak the most common language in the world because you speak perfect English. Dirty English is the most spoken language in the world. So that I could really manage it with the with the builders and uh, you know a couple of months later this shop came out and I really remember as if it was yesterday I came back to my hotel to take a shower uh, you know so that I, I dressed up myself and I came back to the shop the shop was already full with guests and stuff and I seriously can tell you I mean I'm very honest in that I could see it from the outside and I could say fuck it's beautiful. You're good, at it. You're good at it, you know? I mean, that was very important. I'm very, very much honest to myself. I've always been very much honest to myself. So I said, hey, you can mix things, you know? You have a, a background in architecture. You wanted to make movies. The fact is, and, and actually that's another thing that I didn't tell you. I saw the project, the idea of the project, through a script, which was kind of crazy. I mean, it didn't show drawings. I wrote a story and she loved the story. So then I thought, really, you can kind of make movies in 3D. You know, before the 3D movies of like Avatar, <laughs> whatever. But, but really, it was like you could manage the space in order to leave it as if it was a movie. And seriously, I mean, it, it was very satisfaction for me. I mean, I, I loved it. Plus, there was my. Uh, the most beloved uh, actress at the time was Gong Li. You remember the wife of Zhang Jimu? I mean, it was really like she was at the opening. It was really like the, the, bapti the baptism for me. I mean, it was like, okay, now I make you chevalier. <laughs> uh, and, the, and everything started from there because really, um, she, the, the fashion designer Anna Molinari sent me to London to open another one. Then uh, my friends in Milano said, Fabio, you became a big star of architecture. Actually, actually. This is another little secret. At that time, of course, anything you could do, if you were not able to communicate it, st still nowadays like that, it was nothing. I mean, it wouldn't exist. So that I spent kind of a big money in proportion to the time on a very good uh, photo shooting of the shop. Why? Because of course I had all my friends which were become journalists and whatever so that I immediately sent them the pictures of the shop and it went uh, viral at that time. <laughs> no seriously, it was published all over. So that of course that's how you build a reputation. I mean it's very important if you do things and nobody sees them. My God, I mean that's the, that's the handicap of architecture because you have to visit it physically. But if you have very good pictures it can be communicated. And so all my works since then have been very well photographed and they've been viral. I mean, I've, I've had hundreds of covers of, uh, of uh, architecture and design magazines and that helped a lot to be the reputation, of course. And then, I mean, obviously, you do a good job, you do another good job, the third one will come. If you do another good job, the fourth one will come. I mean, it's the story of life. But really, it, it was interesting to explain the turning point because Everything is accidental, you know. If I didn't raise my hand that day in that classroom, probably nothing would have happened. And, uh, you know, I would have gone back to Lecce, uh, the, the, my little town in the south of Italy. And, you know, things are like these. You know, I, probably the secret is to never say no. To always say, yes, I'm open. Yes, let's do it. Sure. You know, that's still my approach to life, and that's what brought me here. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, and how did you... Um cater your, your, your approach in being a storyteller and a movie director and an architect into our, let's say, retail reinvention and our project of translating, let's say, Mediterranean hospitality into a store concept. I mean, that was very easy. I mean, because, I mean, we're very good friends. Also because we really come from the same place. I mean, I know how we grew up 
imagines how I did. I mean, even if there are many years of difference, but really, the, uh, life doesn't change much in our part of the world. <laughs> really, everything stays the same. That's amazing. <laughs> so that I really know uh, which kind of, uh, of need they have. And, uh, and so it was very easy for me because we share the same values, we share the same visions, we, are, we have the same things in our eyes. In, when we close our eyes, the things we see are exactly the same. Are the sea, are the beach, are the countryside, and, and it's exactly the same. And, um, and so before, the format of their shops was very dark, very disco, let's say. And I kind of thought that it was the opposite of, of the spirit of Natuzzi. I mean, Natuzzi is born Mediterranean. I mean, we are in a, in a part of the world which is really a, a cultural bridge of communication. I mean, you have to think that um, we, you know, when um, the, the um, uh, when the Greeks wanted to conquer Italy, they went through Puglia. Uh, or the Turkish or whoever, you know, we have always been a bridge on the Mediterranean, especially on, on the, on the um, east side of the Mediterranean. And, uh, and so we are open, we are really culturally open. We, we are ready for everything, we are, we are ready to embrace any kind of culture. Actually, one of the masterpieces of architecture in, the, in our region is something built by Federico II of Svevia which is a beautiful castle with an octagonal shape. I mean, so that everything has gone through Puglia. I mean, this is something that is in our DNA. We embrace situations. So that I thought, my God, we have to, to show this through space. Plus, you know, uh, raise your hand, who knows which is, who is considered the most important architect in the world? <laughs> who do you think most is considered important. architect in the world? Oh, architect. Not living, eh? I mean, historically. Oh, wow. This is a test Frank just to Wright. understand. Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, he's too young. He's too young. Who? Zaha Hadid. Zaha He's too young as well. Who is the, you know, like the, the, the founding uh, image of modern architecture? Vesuvius. Who? Vesuvius. Vitruvius, no, Vitruvius wrote um, manuals. No, no, I'm talking about real architecture. Who built? Okay, I'm going straight to the point. Le Corbusier. Okay, think about Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier basically is the one who started talking about modern architecture. You know, he took an invention of the uh, Perret brothers in France, which was the Beton Armé. You know that, of course, we can build architecture this way because these two guys in France thought that the the, the expanding uh, of, uh, of metal and uh, cement could fit in order to build big structures. And Le Corbusier was the first one to apply it to real scale. So Le Corbusier, by everybody, I mean, you can ask to Zadida and she's dead, but you can ask in a spirit uh, whatever, and you can ask Frank Lloyd Wright, they both know that Le Corbusier is the one. Okay, but why I'm telling you this? Because Le Corbusier tried all his life to replicate Mediterranean architecture. He was Swiss. I mean, this makes me laugh so much. He was Swiss. But he thought that Mediterranean architecture was the peak of, uh, of the imagination. I mean, you couldn't go farther. So he said, fuck, we have it. We are the Mediterranean architecture. We have all the codes. Let's just apply them. You know, and yesterday, if you were here, I was saying that, you know, a very important invention of, of the Greek culture, that we, uh, we pay tribute to it, is the Agora. The Agora was an empty space where everybody could gather. And I turned the shop into a big Agora, applying something as well, which belongs to our traditional culture, which is the luminarie. You know, it's full of lighting walls that are dedicated usually to celebration. You know, so that for us was Mediterranean spirit, celebration, agora, colors and uh, and um, uh, nuances of, of our land. And these were the ingredients, super easy. And we could shape the space so easily, so fluidly. You know, and it's totally another feeling. I must tell you, I mean, I'm very proud of that because 
compared to the to the last format. It's, it's another thing completely. It gives a different perception of what Natuz is. What what actually it's DNA. Because really before was wrong. Before was another thing, was not explaining what Natuzzi is in, in its roots, you know, in its real essence. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's over. I, have to, I think we have to go. Time's over. Any question that you might answer? Our, our storyteller here can answer. Uh, I explain why I love anything that's made in Italy. Truly, I love anything. Okay. Anything that's made, I, if I lift a bar of soap and it's made in Italy, it's beautiful. I, okay, I don't want to be chauvinistic, okay? Because I hate that, you know, because everybody thinks that his own country is the best in the world. So then I have another opinion about it. It's true. Italy is the mo it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. But we Italians cannot be chauvinistic because we are just lucky to be born there. Because it's just a matter of luck. I mean, think about it. if I was born 1,000 kilometers more south, I would be like dying with anger. You know what I mean? It's like so that it's terrible where you are born. But we as well have a big, uh, uh, what say, uh, a big um, responsibility. We have a huge responsibility. We must be guardian of all this beauty. You know, this, this is so important. I think that we as Italians have a strong task to protect the history of beauty that Italy represents. You know, I always think that the shape of Italy, you know, the, the boot, is so iconic. It probably is the most iconic shape of country in the world. But because Italy is iconic itself, you know, it's, it's really a bridge on the Mediterranean. It's the country that everybody wanted to conquer. It's a country where everybody thought it belongs to me, so that it belongs to the world. It doesn't belong to Italians, it belongs to the world, so that I accept your compliment, thank you very much. I'm not chauvinistic, and I'll tell you, we're going to protect you. <laughs>